Um, so for those that you don't know me, my name is Luke Timmer. I'm the field service supervisor for HECO. A um, little bit on me, I have been with HECO now for just under two years. I'm a welder by trade. I went to trade school to become a welder. Found out real quick that that's not exactly what I wanted to do. Luckily, I fell into the motor business. Um, actually working in the weld shop, building motors from scratch, rebar and restacking rotors. Um, so really, I kind of got started from a very young age on the intricacies of what builds a motor, how do motors work, um, and those types of things. So following that, I did get into the field service world after a few years as being a mechanic. Uh, worked my way through field service teams and started running a field service team for IPS Rock Hill out of Rock Hill, South Carolina. Um, and then got the great opportunity to come here um, and build a field service team out for HECO. Um, HECO has not had um, a dedicated field service team for, for that long. Um, and it was always one of those things that they were robbing Peter to pay Paul. So it was, we were always pulling guys out of our shop um, to go do work for guys like you, you know, out, out of customer sites and they, they need things. But then that also takes away from them being able to get other customers motors out the door. So that was where I came in. And so we've actually been able to start to assemble a field service team that we actually have a dedicated field service team um, that goes out and helps you guys kind of stay reliable anything motor related we handle. So that's kind of my specialty. Um, I stick with motors. It's what I know. It's what I like. It's what I do. Um, I don't claim to know anything outside of that. We look at systems and things like that. I know enough about gearboxes and compressors to troubleshoot and things like that, but motors are my specialty. Um, so today we're going to cover some things that you guys should be doing since you guys are motor owners. Okay. Um, Kind of some basic things, maybe a little bit more complex of some things um, that maybe not be handled in-house, but might be handled by guys like me, but still things that should be looked at and maybe scheduled. So some of those things are going to be oil lubrication inspections. They had a great presentation today on the Lube Expert system. Uh, that was good information about um, you know intervals of greasing, how greasing should be done. Don't just let somebody out there with a grease gun and just start pumping it full of grease. Um, Grease quantities, it's another big one, right? So um, people think that they're doing a great thing by just lubricating their bearings, which they are, but you can also over lubricate them or under lubricate them. Sleep bearings and oil seal inspections. This is another big one. For any of you guys that run medium voltage motors or uh, high voltage motors that have sleeve bearings, something that should be done, and we're gonna get into that a little bit. DC motor brush maintenance and commutator inspections. Another big one for you guys who are still running the old school DC motors. Um, a lot of you guys that have extruders and things like that. This is a good one. Electrical testing and trending. Another huge one that I do regularly. Um, we'll talk a little bit about different test procedures, parameters, and things like that. Uh, we'll talk about some alignments and we'll shoot a couple, couple other things in there. So mechanical reliability. You know, we talk, it's what this is all about, right? This is why we're here, reliability. So we start talking about that. We made the, we make the statements about being reliable and what's gonna keep us reliable. And I made those statements about sleeve bearings. And that's one of the big things that we see with these larger medium voltage motors and things like that are people, it was running fine. It was all great until it wasn't, right? So a lot of times people will not do oil samples. Something as simple as having a tap on your, on your oil sump to have somebody walk around, collect a small bottle of oil, send it out, and get it analyzed. Doing something as simple as that knows whether we're having bearing deterioration. Do we have Babbitt in the bearing, or Babbitt in the oil, excuse me. Do we have particles in there? Do we have metal in there? That's not necessarily Babbitt. All those things are gonna lead us up to, do we need an inspection? I recommend you guys do this once a year. Crack those bearing cases open, have us let us come in, roll those bearings out, and do those types of things. While you're in there, you can do an oil seal inspection, um, all those types of things. Another one that's gonna lead you guys to know when you need to do an inspection or if you have an issue, vibration analysis, right? Some of you guys just sat through the RDI camera. Um, you know, so that kind of going coincides with that. Motor air gap checks for all your larger motors. Um, that is a good check to do on anything that has a stator that can be moved. Um, you guys 
I don't know everybody in here. I know some of your guys' industries and applications. Um, we do a lot of work in the cement mill industry, things like that, that have open synchronous motors, um, pedestal mounted motors. Those are ones that you really want to make sure you're checking air gap on. Um, those stators are easily movable, and if they're not pinned, you'll end up having issues really quick. So that's another check just to do once a year, make sure nothing's moved. So getting a little bit more into bearing inspections here, as you can see, I've got some good photos here from the years of being around this. Um, obviously that picture up on the left hand corner looks pretty bad, right? I mean, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't necessarily take a bearing expert to say, hey, that looks pretty bad. So this is all something that most of the time can be caught. You know, it, it can be. Um, and this is where I recommend that once a year inspection of being able to, hey, let's pop the bearing caps, let's roll the bearing out, let's put them together, let's measure them, let's measure clearances, let's make sure the clearances are proper. Let's check the bearing pattern, okay? Bearing patterning is something that we can start to see a lot of issues arise before they become a problem. A good pattern on the bottom side of a sleeve bearing should have 100% contact across the bottom load zone of that bearing. So this is the bottom half of a sleeve bearing, and you should have 100% contact from here to here, and roughly 30% of a load zone right through the dead center of the bottom of that bearing. That bearing there specifically is a spherical bearing, okay, a self-aligning spherical bearing. So something like that, if it gets hung up inside the housing or things like that, we can know really, really quick if we have an issue where the bearing was hung up, it's not aligned properly, do we have a misalignment in the motor itself? Okay, we can tell a lot by that. Was the, was the bearing sitting in there cocked one way or the other where we're hitting very hard on the inboard side and not so much on the outboard side? Okay, so that's where these inspections go a long way. And it's also a big thing too, if you call somebody in for these inspections, having a little bit of the information for these guys when they come in. What are your bearing temperatures? Were you having vibration issues? Have you seen dark and dirty oil? Have you changed the oil recently? Okay. Oftentimes we run into a lot of issues with these sleeve bearings where guys will go through the process of, hey, we want to change the oil. They do that and someone doesn't realize that they have overfilled the oil sump. Okay, so they'll go, they'll look at the sight glass, they'll fill it up and they don't see the oil come in because the oil is nice and fresh and clean. It's almost clear, right? We've run into that time and time again. So it's more of those things that you guys need to be looking at of, hey, Where's our oil level at? Are we checking it frequently? We fired this motor up, we just changed the oil. Why is it running hot? Let's drain the oil back out of it, okay? It's one of those simple checks. So, clearances, I touched on that just briefly. This is a clearance chart that I carry around me everywhere. This is what we use here at ECO for our standard clearances for sleep bearings. Um, I believe this is an old Westinghouse chart. We will go to certain manufacturers depending on the depending on the manufacturer, the motor, or what we're doing. But this is a pretty good rule of thumb or pretty good standardized chart for sleeve bearing clearances. So you're gonna have your nominal shaft size on the left, your journal size, and then you're gonna have your horizontal and your vertical tolerances as far as what you are allowed to have clearances off the shaft, okay? So this is another great one that if you guys have guys come in to do these sleeve bearing checks, make sure, they're me make sure they are measuring these bearings and make sure that they're meeting tolerances. You guys, 1,800, 3,600 RPM motors, okay? If you start losing some clearance, you're gonna have a lot of vibration really quick. It's gonna start oscillating, okay? Lab seals, I touched on oil seals briefly. Um, labyrinth seals are another one too. If you guys aren't getting them checked, you should. Um, and the other thing too is that it's not necessarily something that's easily removable, but if they can be removed, remove them and clean them. On the bottom side of the labyrinth seal, you guys will actually get a lot of dirt and contamination stuck in the grooves of the labyrinth, will not allow oil to flow back into the motor, it will actually flow out of the motor. So those labyrinth seals are actually designed where they have a hole, Can we go ahead and a picture of those? There they are right there, go ahead. So this is actually a phenolic oil seal. Some of them are aluminum, some of them are phenolic. This is a phenolic oil seal. You'll actually see where there's a hole right here. That's very important, okay? Make sure that's clear. Make sure that that 
actually allows oil back into the sump. Okay, so that's where you guys go in to do these bearing inspections yearly, like I recommend, and you allow your guys to pull these seals out or have somebody pull them out. You can clean them to make sure you're not allowing oil to escape the motor, but rather drain back into the oil sump. Also, another one too is you actually will be able to inspect the shaft. Okay, it's kind of hard to see in here with the way the light is, but if you look at that shaft there where that seal was running, it actually got hung up. Even though that's a floating phenolic seal inside the housing, it got hung up and it rubbed the shaft. It was no longer sealing. So you, they were losing quite a bit of oil. So that's another one that really is a really important thing to kind of keep an eye on, I guess, is if you guys are losing oil out of one of your sleep bearing motors, it's a good place to start. Touched on oil inspections. Um, it's really easy to tell how good of condition your sleep bearing motors are in based on the color of the oil. If you have its own oil source, okay? So if it is not force lubricated, which depending on what you guys have going on, if it is force lubricated, that can kind of lead you down a rabbit hole depending on what all is tied into your lubrication system. Um, as you can see here, we were actually at a cement mill when I worked down in South Carolina, and they had a 5,000 horsepower wound rotor motor this was. Um, and they kept losing large amounts of oil off the opposite drive end bearing. And we'd been there once to try to fix the oil leak and we could not fix it. We could not figure it out. Nothing was sticking out. We went back a second time six months later, dug a little bit more into it and it was on a force lubricated system. Found out their gauges were broken. We would have never known that because we weren't there when it ran. The gauges were broken. Somebody had walked by and the gauges were broken and they turned up the amount of oil that was being fed to the bearing and they were actually creating a spray. So it's coming through the orifice into the, into the bearing housing and it's actually pressurizing the bearing housing, <clears throat> creating a positive, positive negative pressure inside the housing, forcing oil out the seals. Something as simple as that is also something that if you guys have these systems, keep an eye on. Make sure your gauges are working. Make sure that nobody's messed with them. Do you know what the pressure should be? Okay. Are you following OEM specs for those types of things? Um, another one, this is another good one. Weir fittings. Any of you guys that do have an oil system or a force loop system on your motor, make sure those weir fittings are actually where they need to be. And if you guys don't know what a weir fitting is, it's that half moon fitting you see in there. And where that should be is that should be rotated where it's directly on the bottom of that pipe. And what that does is when you guys shut your motor off or you lose your oil system, that motor can still run and operate and it holds enough oil in the sump that it will still have half amount of oil in the sight glass to where that motor can operate and coast down safely. If somebody steps on this pipe, turns this pipe, and you have a weird fitting like that, what's gonna happen is almost all of your oil will drain out of your sump before that motor can coast down and you will smoke your bearings. Collector ring and slip rings. Um, any of you guys that have synchronous motors should be doing a relatively frequent walk by, look, see, sounds and, sounds and sights check, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit on DC motors. Um, you guys really need to be looking to see, are you arcing? Do you guys have a lot of carbon buildup? What do the brushes look like? Um, do you have a lot of pitting on your rings? Something that people don't realize too is that you're throwing direct current through a set of collector rings your set of slip rings, and one ring is the positive ring. One ring is the negative ring. Positive ring almost always is going to deteriorate quicker. A little bit more current on that ring, things like that. Our recommendation is once every six months, flop the polarity on those rings. You will not glaze over one ring worse than the other. They will wear evenly that way. Um, run out should be checked every once in a while. So if you have somebody come in and check in any, any of your um, synchronous motors, if they can, if they can be rotated, it's not a bad idea to throw a dial indicator on there, check the run out, see how bad they are. Um, brush patterns should be checked just like a DC motor. You guys should be looking at your brushes. Are they wearing evenly? Um, anything more than 50% wear, go ahead and change them out. They're not that expensive. Change them out. Let's get them changed, get them seated in, make sure they're ready to go. Um, a little bit more on synchronous motors testing is something that you guys should be doing. Um, 
at least once a year, you guys should be having somebody come in, do electrical testing on your rotor, on your stator, um, on your guys' synchronous motors. You guys really should be getting voltage drops done as well um, on the rotor poles. So you're going to come in, you guys are going to disconnect the rings um, from the rotor circuit itself. So you're isolated right at the back side of the rings. Test back through your rotor. Um, you guys are going to want to do a resistance to ground check and then also do a voltage drop. Okay, so voltage drop, you're going to take 110 volts AC off of a standard plug. Make it a suicide cord, we call it. It's deadly. Make sure nobody's holding on to it when you plug it in. It's a good day. Um, somebody's going to let you know. Plug it in, and then at that point, if you have a 10 pole motor, so you have 110 volts coming out, you should have approximately 10 volts per pole piece. Okay, and if you do not, if you are not, if you have something off by 10 percent or greater, you have an issue. What's well, most likely going to be the start of a short or a shorted pole piece. Okay, um, you probably will not know it if you have one shorted pole piece. You might start harder. You might. Um, your power factor is going to be off, some things like that, but a motor will, it, motor's going to Cadillac along, it doesn't really care. But it's not going to be great for the overall efficiency of the motor. Okay, so another one that it's, it's good that you guys get this done if you guys have this sort of equipment on site. DC motor inspections. How many of you guys have DC motors? Anybody? A couple of you? DC motors are tricky. They're old school, not a lot of people know about them. People are very uncomfortable when they walk by them. They go, oh man, there's brushes and brush handy commutator and it arcs occasionally. And, um, should be really inspected quarterly. Something that requires a little bit more maintenance and a little bit more look-see, okay? Um, you can save yourself a lot of hassle by doing these inspections just by popping the covers on the commutator end, right? Like you don't have to get really down and dirty with them, just something basic. Pop the covers off. Let's see what is happening. Do we have an odd, odd pattern? Do we have grooving? Do we have odd brush wear? Do we have a lot of arcing while it's running? Um, when you guys are down, if you guys have the opportunity, brush inspections. Pop them out of the springs, see what the brushes look like. Are they wearing funny? Has a brush box moved? Something like that. Commutators, visually inspect these. Like I said, do you have grooving? This one here to the left, it's kind of hard to tell, but that actually has an eighth of an inch groove inside that commutator to the point where it's not allowing carbon dust to escape. Um, the, the deeper that goes and the smaller that, um, that undercut gets inside that groove, the more likely you're actually gonna short it out bar to bar. As soon as you short bar to bar, it's gonna arc and it's gonna fail and it's gonna fail pretty hardcore to the point where you guys might even be doing a full rewind with a commutator replacement, okay? So, you start seeing these things, it's better to get it pulled out and swapped out if you guys have a spare than it is to let it run and let it blow up. Because at that point, we can still turn and undercut that for very much minimal cost versus an entire rewind. Mark, our salesman back there, is gonna love a rewind, but let's get it out there, let's get it kind of taken care of before that happens. Brush springs, another big one. You guys should be checking these. Um, tension on brush springs are something that they, they're a wearable item. Think about it as you have a commutator going around, it starts to get out around and those brush springs are constantly working. It's a wearable item. That spring, just like anything else, is going to lose tension over time. Um, they have a, a lot of brush springs nowadays that are much better than the old school designs that are much more of a constant pressure spring. So as they bounce, they don't lose tension. There's constant pressure on that spring. They're not all out there yet though. So um, if you guys are getting things repaired and if you unfortunately send it somewhere else other than HECO, maybe ask about that. Ask about, hey, are there other type of spring that we can put in there that might last a little better, uh, might have a little bit better wear, something like that. Um, blowing out the carbon dust, big one. You gotta be careful doing it. I recommend maybe having somebody like us come in and do it. Um, we do it for a lot of places. We actually um, do it for a steel mill in Northwest Indiana that we do 35 of their motors quarterly. And they have reported to us that they run four times as long on one motor repair that they ever have just by us doing a blow wipe and check. By us going in, checking the springs, checking the brushes, seating brushes in properly when they're replaced, and then blowing them out. Their mega readings, their mega readings, excuse me, increase immensely 
because you're getting all the carbon out of the interns of the computator, you're blowing it through and you're eliminating some of that possibility of grounding. Okay, that's a big one. People oftentimes go, seating in brushes, what is that? It's very important. So when you order brushes, they most of the time are not contoured to the shape of a commutator. They are at an angle and they are just square, just a straight angled cut. And if you put them on there, you are most likely going to only be making contact with maybe half of the amount of bars as it should be. So what happens, anybody blurt this out, what do you think is going to happen if that brush only touches half of the amount of bars it's supposed to? Anybody got any ideas? That brush is going to be seeing a lot more current than what it should be. Okay, so you are already going to greatly diminish the amount of life you're going to see out of that brush just by not seeding it in properly. Because these brushes, think about how long a brush can run for. You can run some of these brushes in these motors for years. So you put it in there and you don't see it and get it to shape of the commutator from the get-go, it is going to run drawing more load on those shunts for six months before it finally gets to the point where it's making contact all the way around. And the likeliness is all that current's got to go somewhere. Most of the time, if you don't seat them in, you will see quite a bit of pin arcing off the edge of those brushes as you first fire up a motor because it's not making good contact. It's going to bounce, it's going to chip, and all that type of stuff. So. The way this should be done is using garnet paper. Garnet paper does not have any sort of metallic alloys in it. So you can't take a simple sandpaper, you can't take emery cloth, you can't take anything like that. Because if you do that, the problem is you're going to get metallic material inside the face of that brush. And as soon as you do, it's going to rub off on the comm and you're going to have all sorts of problems. It's going to arc like crazy, it's not going to run very well. You're going to be calling me going, why is my motor running like crap? So they sell it, uh, you can get it from Hellway Carbon, you can get it from, I think you can get it from MSC, I think you can get it from a bunch of places. Um, they come in different grits, I like a good aggressive grit, just get it down there, let the motor do the work once you get it kind of down close to, to calm shape, and let it run. Um, filters, any of you guys DC motors that have filters, change them out weekly. Daily. Do you guys change them out daily? Good for you. Start people, you just started there. No. Um, so, recommended weekly, depending on the environment, you guys should be changing them out pretty frequently. Um, I know that's a cost, but it saves you guys in the long run. You're not starting your motors for air. Sights and sounds, I talked about the sights and sounds check, okay? It's a big one. Not even having to take covers off necessarily. Just having guys walking around doing a check of your guys' DC motors or any motor for that fact. Stop them by, is it running hotter? Does it make funny noises? Do we see anything going on? This is a prime example, I'm gonna play this video. It's kind of hard to see up here, but you should be able to hear it. Um, this is the one that we got from a customer and they're like, man, it's arcing like crazy, it's making a lot of noise. Um, okay, you can kind of see the arcing going on there, I know it's kind of hard to see in here. This is caused by a high bar, okay? So the high bar on comm, you end up actually getting a little bit of banding coming loose on this particular commutator, allowing one of the bars to become high by a couple thousands. And it sounds like a baseball card in spokes, okay? So it goes around and you hear that like you did as a kid, thought you were super cool. Um, somebody noticed this by doing just a simple walk by and they said, hey, something's not right. Uh, something else, it's not a bad idea. I don't recommend necessarily going around with a laser and just checking alignments all the time. But I don't know what you guys are using for your specifications. If you guys are having your guys put them in, I highly recommend you have you guys using lasers. I highly recommend you guys have your guys trained on how to use the laser, not just here, take this and go out there and figure it out. Um, there's a lot of alignments, in my opinion, are a simple thing. But there's a lot of miscommunication and misinformation out there about alignments. Okay, a lot of people don't understand the difference between coupling alignment and shaft alignment. They need to be doing shaft alignments, not coupling alignments. Okay, um, couplings take a lot of wear, motor bearings don't. Okay, so this chart up here that you see towards the top, 
That is a motor tolerance recommendation based on speed, okay? Based on speed for your guys' um, alignment tolerances, okay? Obviously, the higher the speed, the tighter the tolerance. Um, soft foot, make sure you guys are checking for soft foot. This is a big one, it's a really big one, okay? If you guys have, especially if you guys have new sections of your plants that go in, um, things are up on elevated bases. Go around and have your guys check every once in a while. The fat of your finger is a great tool. As a vibration guy, the fat of your finger is awesome. Walk it around and check to see, is that foundation settled and has a crack at the bottom and do we have a lot of movement? Is the motor starting to bounce towards the feet? Do we have a possible soft foot, okay? Something like that can save you guys a bunch of time. One of you guys walks around and says, hey, I think that motor is moving. Go out there, when you guys are down, put a dial indicator on it, crack the bolt, is it loose? And if it is, fix it. Um, simple things like that, I know they're not necessarily simple, but they're big money savers. Vibration analysis, um, this is one that I would say it's very, very important, but it's also can be misleading, I guess. Um, so I don't know if you guys can see this photo down here on the bottom. That's a brand new uh, T-Mic motor that was installed down in South Carolina. Somebody had this bright idea to put a two-pole motor that weighs over 10,000 pounds up on that. Okay? Well, there's no problems with that, right? It'll run. Um, to the point where we had to convince them that it wasn't a motor problem, it was a base problem. Um, and we ended up actually putting almost four pounds of weight on one side of that motor to balance it out because there was so much resonance off the base, okay? Um, so obviously you eliminate the vibration, you can increase everything, you know? I mean, you guys have been through hundreds and hundreds of conversations about how great vibration is, right? I'm not gonna bore you with that stuff, but you know, I don't know how you guys have you doing your vibration. Um, our guys do it. Our guys are great. We have Cat 3, Cat 4 guys. Um, I highly recommend our guys. I don't know if any of you guys in here are going to have liquid restats. If you do, you can just ignore me. Or if you don't, you can just ignore me for the next two minutes. Um, this is going to be on any of you guys that have large wound rotor motors. Okay, You see this a lot in shredder applications. We also will see this in cement mill applications where they have large wound rotor motors on their finish mills. Um, on the finish mill side of things for um, cement mills, that is used straight up for just startup torque. What that does, your liquid rheostat is in the circuit on the rotor circuit. If you have two electrodes farther apart in water, depending on the design of the uh, rheostat, creates a higher resistance, higher torque. So you want a large amount of resistance at startup, large amount of bottom end torque. You're starting up a giant ball mill with a lot of steel balls in it a lot of cement dust, things like that. You want a lot of bottom end torque to get it started. As it comes up to speed, that resistance reduces, the rotor gets to sink into speed and it cuts off. Contactor flips, takes it right out of the circuit. Uh, in a shredder application, say you're taking Cadillacs, you're taking them through a car shredder, right? 1980s Cadillac with a lot of steel. They want that in the circuit all the time because torque is always varying. So they leave that in the circuit, motor loads down, liquid rheostat comes in and out, Changes your resistance, changes your torque values, everything stays where it needs to be. Inspections on these should be done every six months. You guys should be checking the water, should be checking the uh, electrodes, flushing the tanks. Um, heat exchangers, if you guys have them, they get gross, need to be cleaned out. Please use distilled water, don't use city water. City water will mess with the soda ash mixture and will arch, will create all sorts of problems, will rush your electrodes a lot faster. Um, all the chemicals they put in that water for us to drink and take showers with, not real great on metal. Large motor turnkeys, this is one I recommend for any of you guys that have large motors, maybe get a guy like me to do it. It goes a lot quicker, it goes a lot smoother. Um, part of it too is that a lot of times um, we will actually extend your warranties if you let us put them in because then we will have alignment data, we'll have startup data with vibration, uncoupled and coupled if we can get it with you guys depending on what your SCADA systems allow, um, if there's any interlocks for us to run uncoupled or not. Uh, also, as well as documentation, okay? So we're gonna have documentation of alignment, soft foot checks, like I said, vibration. 
We're also going to be checking if we're putting in like a pedestal mounted motor you see up on the left. At that point, we'll have bearing clearances. We will have all that types of stuff for you guys to put in your files and documented that you might not get if you have one of your guys that plan to it because they might not know to do that. Okay, so that's something I highly recommend. Uh, basically, just touched on that advantages of having somebody do some of this stuff for you, right? So some of these things I touched on might not pertain to you. Some of it might. Um, and I'm hoping that maybe you guys picked up on something um, that maybe was at least a little bit helpful. Um, something as simple as like DC motor maintenance, having somebody see in brushes that know how they're doing it, A, they can go a lot quicker, and B, you know it's done right. And you know it's done with the right product. It's not some guy who goes, I don't need to use garnet paper. We don't have any of that. Let me go grab some of that sandpaper out there, right? So those types of things, it's always a good thing to have somebody like me or one of my guys come out and help you.